Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here again for a couple of minutes of chit chat. Chit chit chat. Someone asked me last week what that meant, um, and it is in the Cambridge Dictionary, I think, as meaning small talk. So we are here in a slightly chilly church, but getting warmer, and the sun is still shining outside, but we're told it may disappear by the time we leave the building. Um, hoping that all of you who watch, wherever you're watching from, and whenever you're watching, um, have had a good week and will have a good week and know God's blessing in the week to come and that we will be able to, well in Australia, to continue to suppress the virus. I know some of you watch from the UK and the US and your numbers are still very high but we're told they're getting lower and so we hope that will be the case and that we as societies will work together to get over this virus and also work together to solve some of the issues we have as societies in ways that are good for everyone. And I think the time is counting down to 11 a.m. So I will hand over to Graham. Thank you, Christine. It is indeed 11 o'clock in uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time. And uh, whatever time zone you're watching in, uh, a warm welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church. My name, as you just heard, is Graham Bradbeer, and I'm currently the minister here, have been for five years. Thank you for joining us. This is our 13th stream service. That means it's a full uh, quarter of a year now. Uh, that we've been learning to be the church during our coronavirus pandemic. And I'm grateful to numerous people who have participated in helping us with uh, discovering how to stream online and sustain our services. You can find the PDF of our regular services uh, on the church website, blackburnpc.org.au. It's uh, free to download and uh, there's a the sermon notes are included in that. You can also find uh, previous studies there and, uh, and even talks by previous ministers. I understand some of Peter Locke's sermons have been well listened to in West Africa. But, uh, so there's a whole range of options there. If you'd like to leave a comment on the Facebook page, we would love to hear from you. If you have questions or anything you'd like to say, we will endeavor to respond to you uh, individually. Again this week, Amanda, uh, who uh, has been playing for us on her viola, uh, is in Adelaide with her mother. Uh, she has still played for us, but the recording has come through a long supply chain, a deeply committed supply chain, through uh, reformatting uh, in Bacchus Marsh and then again in Melbourne. And so the quality is not as uh, high as we have uh, got used to with having Amanda with us in person. But uh, we're going to begin and end with uh, a piece of music played by Amanda, and we're grateful to you, Amanda, for going to the trouble of uh, recording it for us in Adelaide and sending it on to Ian. We look forward to having you back live next week, and we're so glad that your mother is improving as much as she has. That's really good. So as we pray this morning and as we listen to the Holy Scriptures and as we reflect on them together, let us pursue how to put into practice in our lives today and every day the message of the teachings of the Lord Jesus. So I invite you to join the worship of God with us and we'll begin with Amanda playing Largo by Telemann.
Thank you, Amanda. Let us pray. Lord, as we join together around your word, our prayer is that you will still our hearts and by your spirit enable us to hear the word that brings life. And so, Lord, wherever we are at this moment in time, may you be with us, lead and guide us, and direct our steps, Lord Jesus. Amen. Christine is bringing us young at heart today. Thank you, Christine. And apologies, Amanda, I forgot to turn off the central heating until halfway through your playing. And as you know, that's one of my tasks because it does interfere. Um, okay, this week I thought I would um, talk about children lost and found. And this, I've deliberately made the title plural and I mean children in large numbers, not just two children who were lost and thankfully found in Australia. Anyway, this time last week, most of us had never heard of William Callaghan. Today, if you mentioned his name to an adult, at least in Victoria, and they responded by saying, who's he? You'd wonder whether they had been locked away in a closed room for a week. But before I talk about the fright that William gave his loved ones and the wonderful story of his rescue, I just want to mention for the older young at heart amongst us, an Australian government statistic that came to our attention this week. On the night of the census in 2016, Around 19,400 children under 14 were homeless in Australia. 19,400 under 14. And mostly for reasons such as domestic and family violence or family breakdown. I leave that statistic with the older young, with the older young at heart among us as I know we all love children and care about them. Let's think and pray about what we can do about this. But back to William Callaghan. Last Monday, which was a public holiday in Victoria and New South Wales, I'm not sure about other states, William went walking with his family a mount at Mount Disappointment north of Melbourne. Quite near the summit, he wandered off from his family. If I look to the left, I'm just reminding Graham to put a picture up. As you can see, it is a thickly wooded area and they could not find William before dark. Monday night, all day Tuesday and all through Tuesday night, they, so his family and friends, and 450 to 500 people who did not know William searched for him. The whole state, and I think the whole nation, watched and waited. The heavily wooded terrain, the freezing cold nights, they were freezing, you know, actually below freezing. For, for those of you in parts of the UK, and the US who think we don't know what freezing is. We actually did go below zero in some parts. But these were not the only worries. William has what is called non-verbal autism. So he can't speak, loud noises frighten him, he doesn't like being hugged or crowded by people. All the people living in that area were asked to check out their outhouses in case he'd gone into one of them for comfort and safety, and also to leave out some of his favorite food, including peanut butter sandwiches. And they were asked to cook bacon on a barbecue, and if the barbecue, if they were cooking bacon inside, to leave the windows open, but if possible to barbecue so the smell would waft out to him because William loves food. 
loudspeakers, and I think this is so beautiful, loudspeakers played the theme music from Thomas the Tank Engine out into the search area because he also loves Thomas the Tank Engine. By Wednesday morning, so he'd been missing since Monday, two nights out in freezing temperatures, I, for one, did not believe he could be found alive. But around noon, the wonderful news came, and I still tear up thinking about it. Ben Gibbs, a searcher who knows Mount Disappointment well, decided to go off track. Thankfully, this was so well organised, previous searchers had left clear indications of where they'd been, so Ben didn't just go over old ground. And about 10 minutes walk away from the track, he found William, barefoot and with his hands over his ears to shut out the noise of the helicopter overhead looking for him. Ben gave him some chocolate, and I know at least one member of our congregation who would love that part of the story, gave him some chocolates and socks and spoke to him about diesel from Thomas the Tank Engine series. William became calm. He had also messaged to or sent, sent word through for the helicopter to go. William became calm and allowed himself to be carried back to his waiting family. Despite being nonverbal, William found a way to let them know he wanted to go to McDonald's, who probably appreciated the free advertising. I cried, as, as I'm sure many of you did, and my tears were not just of joy and relief that this beloved child had been found, but of gratitude and admiration for all the searchers, you know, SES, police, Fire, you know, trained people, but also the public. I grieve that there is so much hatred in the world, so many wars, so much persecution, but I'm also grieving for Australia that the wonderful unity we as a nation experienced at the height of the pandemic, people are starting to retreat back into their groups shouting at those who think differently, in some cases even attacking them physically, instead of being prepared to listen and maybe learn. To know that hundreds of strangers could unite to search for and to find a missing child that whom they didn't know still makes my heart sing. And I should acknowledge there was one boy missing, but much less seriously so in New South Wales, who also was found. But my heart sang, and I dare to suggest there was also rejoicing in heaven. Jesus did, after all, say, as reported in chapter 18, verse 10 of Matthew's Gospel, See that you do not look down, on one of these little ones, maybe particularly one of these disabled little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. May God protect all children. Thank you, Christine. Suzanne is now going to bring us the scripture reading, which comes from the uh, 13th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Thank you, Suzanne. Good morning. Today's reading comes from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 to 16. The Parable of the Sower That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed, 
As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Suzanne. May God bless his word to us indeed. Well, as we came to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which was what we were looking at when the lockdown began, Uh, I pointed out that there were five wayside markers in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Route markers along ancient Roman roads told which cities were nearby and gave some idea of distances, how many stadia. We're used to the idea of wayside markers. Uh, Well, Mark has put these into his Gospel. Here's an image of a Roman route marker. And if we were to think about today, this might be the kind of route marker that we would see. Uh, This is uh, on one of our motorways, uh, freeways, advising about stopping the spread of coronavirus by uh, avoiding unnecessary travel. So let's just think about route markers and pick them up in Matthew's Gospel. The the first route marker was at the end of chapter 7, the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus had finished all of this. Then Matthew tells us what he, he did next. But then a little later on in chapter 11, we saw last week when Jesus had finished teaching his disciples. And that meant that there was a block of teaching there that preceded that. And we looked at that last week, chapter 10, Jesus commissioning the disciples, calling them apostles and explaining the mission to them, the mission of the kingdom. Now today, at the end of the 13th chapter, we we have these words when Jesus had finished these parables. So the parables in chapter 13 uh, are the next block of teaching. And the two remaining markers are at, the end, at the beginning of chapter 19 when Jesus had finished these words and in chapter 26 when Jesus had finished all these words. Well, we're looking at this third wayside marker today. And in chapter 13 we have the puzzle of parables. So I'm thinking about the puzzle of parables or puzzling parables. And there are four points that I want to uh, draw your attention to. Firstly, uh, the word is a seed. Secondly, the Son of Man judges. Thirdly, the need for patience before the harvest. And then finally, something that is to be valued above everything else. So the word is a seed. The seven parables in chapter 13... uh, are broadly centered around the idea of seed, something small that grows. Uh, if you download the, the leaflet, I've, I've underlined the, uh, 
the, the parables, and four of them are unique to Matthew. The others are found in the other Gospels. Uh, the sower, the mustard seed, the wheat and the tares, the leaven, the woman kneading the dough, the hidden treasure, the pearl of great price, and then the dragnet. Those are the seven parables. And many of us have heard these parables early in our lives. They're stories easily retold to children. And I would be very surprised if uh, most of our uh, people who engage in our churches have not heard these stories from early in their lives, from Sunday school days. But parables don't always provide clarity. To you it is given, Jesus said to the disciples who came to ask about the meaning of the parable of the sower. To you it is given to know, but to those who are on the outside, their hearts can be hardened. They've, they've, they're not receiving the message. Parables don't always provide clarity. Sometimes they seem to provide obscurity. Let me begin with a parable, perhaps a story at least of our own. I want to tell you about a man called Tony Renardo. He was awarded a member of the Order of Australia a year ago, January 2019. He's an, agron an agronomist and a missionary, and he wanted to plant a million trees in West Africa, in the Sahel, that border area between the Shahara Desert and the more tropical areas below. And as the desert was moving further south, there was a need to fight back against it. Uh, one day, when he was on his knees, reducing the air pressure in the tires of his car so that he could get traction on the sand, he, he spotted a bush. Um, not a burning bush, but a bush that looked a bit like a tree that he'd seen. And so he went and looked more closely. And with inspection, he discovered that it was the same type of tree that had been cut down all over the place, and it was struggling to come through the sand. And at this point, he realized there was a root structure, like an underground forest, he said. And if rightly pruned, the bush could become a tree. Since then, he developed what's been called farmer-managed natural regeneration. You can check up, check up on him yourself, but here's a clip about him, Tony Renato. Well, as you can see there on the screen, Tony Renato not only received the uh, Order of Australia but Medal, but he, he also received the Right Livelihood Award, which is uh, sometimes being called the alternative uh, Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. He was a missionary with uh, SIM and uh, then with World Vision, and I understand his position is still with World Vision, and he has a, an immense vision. So he, we'll come back to Tony and... Uh, and think a little bit more about that as a sort of parable later on. But we're familiar with the, uh, the parables from the Bible. We've, as I've already said, we, we're used to have, having heard them from, from childhood. Uh, we're not the only ones. Vincent van Gogh knew the stories from childhood. His father was a minister and his, I think both his grandfathers were ministers. I may be wrong there. I might be getting mixed up with 
another person I was reading about during the week. But uh, I discovered that in 1888, uh, Van Gogh did his uh, painting of, <coughs> pardon me, a painting of the sower. And in fact, he did over 30 paintings of the sower. And so there's a whole uh, collection of sower paintings that so impressed Van Gogh. And uh, if you think about it, uh, this is uh, somebody else's drawing of uh, a tree with many birds, the birds of the air coming and nestling in it, something that grew. This is the mustard seed depicted. This is a wheat field by Van Gogh. And you can imagine, you can see alternative uh, things growing in the field. And of course, there are trees as well. And trees come into the story that we're thinking about here. And, and so later in life, uh, after his father's death, Van Gogh painted his father's Bible. And alongside it, he painted uh, a little book by... Uh, I'm sure I've got the name somewhere here. Zola. Yes, Emil Zola. And Emil Zola in the book raises the kind of puzzles. It's a novel and it raises the puzzles that happen in life. How do things work out? And so uh, we, we, we see that questions would be arising in Van Gogh's mind. Questions like, where is God and what is God doing? These are the struggles we have. And those of you who know uh, the... Uh, the song uh, Vincent by uh, Don McLean will know the kind of struggles that, that Vincent van Gogh struggled with in his own life. So the, the stories of parables, the word is a seed. And in, in the passage, chapter 13, we, we discover that Jesus quotes Psalm 78, I will tell them things unknown since the creation. So right there in the chapter, we have this reference back to the seed being the creative word of God, that God's word is able to bring new life. God spoke and it was so. It's also clear from the way in which a prophet was tested, whether he agreed with the revelation given to Moses or not, whether he was an authentic prophet. So the five books of Moses are echoed, as we've seen, in the way in which Matthew has structured these five segments of teaching of Jesus throughout his gospel. And he's placed the parables, the chapter we're looking at today, right at the center. The seed is small, insignificantly small, like mustard seed, for example, who has heard of God's message. To, to whom does God's message reach? The danger of having our ears blocked is very real. There's an enemy whose clamor for our attention drowns out the still small voice. That speaks to us about our lives. The seed is there, it's small, but it has enormous potential to bring forth new life. But reality must reckon with the kind of injustice that Zola picks out. Justice is double-edged. We too will be judged. We may want to see justice, but we need to bear in mind that God's justice will come to us as well. And we dare not assume only our enemies will be judged. Although we are impatient for justice, we must take care what we ask for. Judgment will come. And God will delegate this, we are told, in this chapter, as we were told actually in the previous chapter as well. He will delegate the judgment to the Son of Man, a character we met in chapter 10, verse 23, and who has echoes of Daniel chapter 7. And we're aware that this is Jesus' favorite way of referring to himself, the human one. All judgment is referred to him. And we are told in the story of the wheat and the tares, the parable, uh, which is also explained to us that uh, the Son of Man will send forth his angels into the earth and at the end he will gather the wheat with the tares. And we err badly when we think we can do God's job of judgment. Jesus is clear, and we'll see it more as we go on, that there will be reversals and surprises. We need to ask for mercy, not pronounce judgment on others. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, judge not lest ye be not judged. Remember, Jesus is saying, don't be censor censorious. Don't imagine that you have the answers all the time here. Your attitude to others should be merciful, compassionate, and understanding. Judgment is God's job 
not yours, not mine. Matthew makes it clear uh, as he moves on that it is the Son of Man who judges then. And he, he picks up the idea of judgment from the Old Testament from the Emmanuel book. That is from Isaiah chapters 6 to 12. And in those chapters we are told that the royal line of David is like a tree that has been cut down. The cities will be desolate, the houses abandoned, and he uses the image of a tree, only a stump left. And the people to whom Isaiah uh, must take God's message, Israel and Judah, will be desolate. Their cities will be, be destroyed, their homes will be ruined and abandoned. What on earth was God doing? This was the anticipation of the exile. Here was the justice of God catching up with a people who had grown arrogant and presumptuous. Mentions them in chapter, Isaiah, chapter, uh, chapter 9. They were impervious to the cry of the needy and failed to show mercy. They were exploiting, as Isaiah says in chapter 10, the widows and the orphans. And so the nation was cut down in judgment because of their evil ways. It's a sobering thought. God sowed mercy and forgiveness. But Israel and Judah responded with arrogance and wickedness. And Israel's, Isaiah's ancient parable of a tree stump reminds us that judgment is real. And the prophet's parable didn't make it simple to understand because he says those words, no matter how much you listen, you will not understand. This is the mandate that Isaiah had, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. No matter how much you listen, you will not understand. And no matter how much you look, you will not know what is happening. We heard Suzanne read these words a few moments ago because Jesus quoted them in chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. Jesus' parables in Matthew preserve a kind of obscurity. The truth is there. But as Matthew Henry explained a long time ago, the truth of the parable is like a nut. It's difficult to penetrate and you have to work hard to get to the kernel. What will that day of justice when the Son of Man judges, what will that day bring? Well, a harvest is coming, but we need patience. We're impatient for the work of God to be complete and obvious. We want vindication. But God is merciful. He's not rushing. His timing is not our timing. He wants the seed to grow and bear fruit. He's long-suffering towards us. But what do we want is the cry, often in a deserving and important cause. Well, whatever it is, that cause, we want it now. You know, that response, we see it again and again in demonstrations. We need the patience of the farmer, sowing in hope. We need the, the patience of the housewife, kneading the yeast and then waiting for the rising of the dough before it can be baked. As Isaiah reminds us, the house of David is not finished. Matthew begins his gospel, the very first chapter, with a long genealogy which we often skip over. What, but why is it there? It's there for a reason. What is the reason? He's demonstrating to us that the line of David has come to Jesus, God's Messiah. And how does the Messiah sow the seed? Well, think again about the story of the sower. We didn't read the uh, extended explanation of it, but perhaps you'll remember, or if, you, if you know Van Gogh's images of the sower, walking through the field with weeds and rocks and a harvest coming up behind him. He sows on the stony ground, he sows on the weedy ground, he sows on the path, but he sows on soil. And it, the, uh, the tremendous image here is of wasteful generosity, God extending the seed wherever there's a possibility at all. Not only where the soil is prepared, but where it's rocky, where it's hard-worn, and where it's weedy, where other things would choke it. To ignore Jesus will bring devastation. It will bring it to Jerusalem, as he later laments, because they would not hear his message of peace. The mercy was that that brought the message to the Gentiles, to you and to me. And our challenge is to share it because it became our opportunity and our blessing. 
And at this point, uh, the the, uh, the harvest is is beckoning. This is a, a view from uh, from space of the uh, Sahel region of Africa. So the Sahara Desert and the Great Green Wall of Africa. This is part of what uh, Tony Renato has been doing. You, this, this map takes it from uh, the Gambia, which is over on the Atlantic coast of West Africa, right across to, uh, well, Ethiopia doesn't have a seaport any longer since the Eritrean War, but it takes it right across to Ethiopia, where Tony Renato's policies have regenerated an area the size of Tasmania. Uh, it's just, it's not all Tony Renato. There were different ways that were tried. And Tony Renato, as you will hear, had an enormous challenge and disappointment. But he stuck at it. He was working at something that he knew mattered. And so uh, here is something that has to be valued over all. The disciples came to Jesus and they sought insight. They wanted to know, tell us the meaning of the parable. They wanted to wrestle with it. They wanted to do what Matthew Henry said and crack it, get, open it up. And you and I too, we must continue to explore Jesus' message. One of the humbling things for me during this period of lockdown has been that I've learned things in Matthew's gospel that I've not noticed before. It's hard to imagine. I've been a minister for 48 years. And there are new things coming. But then at the end of the chapter, if you read it, you'll see that it says that things old and new will come out of the scriptures. The seed brings these things forth. So we need to continue to explore the message and ask what prevents us from hearing? What competing voices crowd out the seed so that it bears so little fruit? What desires choke God's word in our lives? Well, explaining the parable of the weeds Jesus refers to the furnace that will consume all that is evil. This is an echo of Daniel as well. So Daniel and Isaiah were in Jesus' mind. In Daniel 4 we read that the, in Babylon the deadly heat of Nebuchadnezzar's furnace could not destroy the seed of God. So how do you invest time and energy to understand the message of Jesus? Well, it's crucial to act. The parables call for action. We heard at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that hearing the message isn't enough. You're blessed if you hear, but if you hear and don't do anything about it, your judgment is all the greater. Like a person who built a house on a rock, we must secure our lives on the message of Jesus and build on him. Two of the parables from this central chapter concern urgent action. The treasure in the field and the pearl of great price. Both of them tell us that the person concerned found the one thing that mattered more than everything. Discovering the kingdom of God, if I might return to Tony Renato, is, this, is like him discovering a network of vast life-sustaining roots that underlie millions of hectares of the Sahel. Huge areas have been revegetated, as I showed you on the map, and it's pro pro become productive again. Tony Renato went to, for those of you who are in Victoria, uh, went to Deep Dean uh, Uniting Church, uh, Presbyterian and then Uniting Church. He, he went to Armadale New, in uh, New England, uh, New South Wales, uh, to study agronomy. And when I went to Warburton in 1980, the following year, he went to Niger to start his tree planting. It wasn't easy. Let me read to you what he said in an interview last year. <laughs> he says in Niger they called him the mad white farmer. He said what we did was we realized the tree planting idea wasn't going to have any impact whatsoever. It was expensive. It was a failure in terms of survival rate. The people weren't interested. And what came about really is an answer to a very frustrated prayer. God revealed that actually everything that we need is already there. While the trees had been cut down, they weren't dead, and the stumps, sometimes like pieces of living root and often seed stock, the seed bank in the soil, the remnant seeds, they were there. And all that was required 
was a change in behavior and the rest was history. They needed to prune the shoots that were coming through and decide which ones they should allow to grow instead of hacking them all down. The Great Green Wall of Africa, Tony Renato's uh, contributed so substantially towards it, is an emerging reality and visible from space. It's creating hope and joy for people who have lived at subsistence level above the seeds. They've been dying above the seeds that could sustain their lives. The parables of the kingdom are not to be shelved for some later time. The need for change is now. The seed is already here. That's what Jesus is saying. The sower sows the word. The word is there in the Old Testament and the word incarnate. Jesus himself came. And if the seed must die, that's what he did. He gave himself for us. All that is needed, said Tony Renato, is a change in our behavior. The pearl and treasure finders change their behavior. We read, they, so, they sell everything for the one thing that matters. I urge you to open your life anew to the words of Jesus today. Let the seeds of the kingdom transform your world. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the words of Jesus. Help us day by day to listen with fresh ears to his teaching. May his words dwell in us richly and cause us to act on what we've heard in such a way that his message of new life, forgiveness and joy reveal your presence in all the earth. Please forgive us for those times when we have turned to selfishness and greed. We are appalled at the priorities that guide the spending of the nations and yet we recognize that we are complicit in the choices of our leaders. Have mercy on us. We pray that in the world of our day, we will understand how to provide food for the hungry, refreshment to the thirsty, welcome to the refugee, clothing to the naked, healing for the sick, visits to the prisoner, and to provide homes for the homeless, especially children. May we just do it as unto you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that the National Cabinet has given us a vision of politicians with various shades demonstrating uncommon unity of purpose. Help them to carry this lesson forward. As coronavirus restrictions are easing at various rates, help us to emerge safely into community life and discourse, concerned for others as much as ourselves. Thank you that William Callaghan and Darshan Siegel, who was missing in New South Wales, were both found safely and for all the goodwill that went into searching for them. Remember COVID-19 remains real and we pray for wise management where the virus is still raging. Grant inspiration to medical researchers pursuing treatment and vaccine. Comfort all who have lost loved ones Speak calm and reassurance to families feeling frustration, stress and anger because of loss of income. We pray that justice will prevail in Australia and throughout the world and especially that authorities will be able to manage difficult situations without anyone being harmed. We pray that those who are deeply concerned about Aboriginal deaths in custody, in custody and other inequities will find ways of expressing their concern without risking the spread of COVID-19. Protect your children wherever they suffer from brutal systemic attacks of Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab. Turn the hearts of enemies into friends. We also ask for the safety of Christians and other minority religions in nations which deny or restrict religious freedom. We long for the reign of the Prince of Peace. Guide us safely and surely into your kingdom. Help all of us who call you our Father to be characterized as peacemakers in our homes, communities, and wider society, and even in our small corner of the family of nations. Enable us to live this week as those who are more and more obviously seated by the person of the Lord Jesus. Help us to hold to him 
with sincere and loving hearts. Unite us now, Lord, as we pray in the words he taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our transgressions as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we think about these things, I invite you to listen to Amanda playing Adagio. Thank you again, Amanda. May God bless you. And uh, this week, stop the spread of COVID-19 and avoid unnecessary travel. God bless you. The benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with you and with those whom you love today and always. Amen.